Hello, and welcome to Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about the people behind today's science headlines. People just like you working to understand viruses and how they affect you. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we are talking with faculty involved in coronavirus and COVID-19 related research so that you can learn who they are and what they do. I am Larissa Thackray, and I'm hosting this podcast from America's heartland in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, August 6th, 2020, we have with us Dr. Susan Weiss, Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Microbiology and Co-Director of the Penn Center for Research on Coronaviruses and Other Emerging Pathogens at the Perlman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania. Susan obtained her PhD in microbiology from Harvard University working on paramyxoviruses and did postdoctoral training in retroviruses at University of California, San Francisco. She has worked on many aspects of coronavirus replication and pathogenesis over the last 40 years and has made many contributions to understanding the basic biology of coronaviruses, as well as their interactions with the host innate immune response. Hi, Susan. Happy to have you with us today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you become interested in virology research? How did you become interested in coronavirus research? Okay, well, when I was in college, I worked in bacteriology labs, and I thought I really wanted to work on um, gene expression in E. coli because it, it really fascinated me. This is back in the, like, around this early 70s. Um, and then when, but when I got to um, grad school, I did a rotation in a bacteriology lab, and it really wasn't very satisfying. It was just not a good match. So um, I tried vi a virology lab, and I, I was on, uh, worked on NDV, Newcastle disease virus, and I really, really liked the lab, plus I liked the virology, so I became a virologist. And, um, and I stayed in that lab, and um, it was a really great experience. And Michael Bratt, um, he kind of left science early, but he was a really great mentor. Um, and so then um, when I finished grad school, I went out and did a postdoc at UCSF with Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus on retroviruses. And so um, there too, I worked on, I, both labs, I worked on RNA, um, and in, in um, the Bishop Varmus lab, I worked on um, really defining the RNAs of Rouse sarcoma virus. Uh, we, and during that time, it, uh, splicing was discovered. And so we, were, we, we found splicing in the retroviral RNAs very early on. So that was one exciting thing. And we also found, um, we looked at the mechanism of gag pol translation, which turned out to be a frame shift, just like um, we now know about coronaviruses. So anyway, after at, towards the end of my time in the Bishop Varmus lab, I realized I didn't want to work on retroviruses anymore because they were really going, it was pre-HIV, so it was really going in the oncogene direction, and I, I really wanted to be a virologist, so I wanted to go back to, to RNA viruses. So I literally looked through the Journal of Virology for a topic, and I found these coronaviruses, which at the time, there was not a whole lot known about them, um, but they were appealing for two reasons. There were, um, it was just the time when people could start cloning um, RNA, RNA, it was still not easy, but you could start to do it and sequencing was sort of new. So it was a, it was a system that was ready to be done molecular, have molecular biology done on. And that was really my background. But the other thing was that there was a great animal model for, um, for liver, dis for hepatitis and encephalitis and demyelination, like it was a model for multiple sclerosis. So the combination of this great, what I thought really interesting biology and, and, a, and a totally really unknown, um, unknown about the mechanisms of transcription and translation, which turned out to be very, very interesting, um, was really ripe for the picking. And so I did, I actually met somebody who at UCSD, Julian Leibowitz was working on these viruses and I went down, down there and he, um, I spent a few days there and he actually gave me all the materials. And then this is even more fun. He came back with me. So, so, I, we, so then he came up to San Francisco and we spent a week working on, on this stuff together. And we ended up uh, publishing a bunch of papers together. But the most really remarkable thing was that, that Mike Bishop let me work on um, coronaviruses for a whole year in his lab. Um, yeah, while well, I was sort of finishing up my retrovirus stuff, but I was mostly working on coronaviruses. And I, I didn't realize at the time what an incredible gift that was. And that got me started in my, so when I went to look for jobs, I, I, my seminars were of course on retroviruses because that was most of what I did, but, but I told them I was going to work on coronaviruses. So that was, I was very lucky that way. You have come a long way from those initial studies on coronaviruses. So how would you describe your research path? 
how did you get to where you are in your career today? Okay, so my path, I guess compared to a lot of people, was pretty straightforward. I've been in the same place since 1980. Um, I've worked on, for a long time, I worked on the mouse hepatitis virus. And then I just kind of, um, I worked on that a lot of different, uh, many, many different aspects. So I really stayed with one virus, but I kind of feel like I, I was um, both broad and deep because I worked on um, the uh, replication, the proteases, the, um, the non-structural proteins. I worked on a lot on the animal model, trying to define the determinants of virulence and pathogenesis. And then through that stuff, I did that for a long time, um, like working with Kay on the, on the CCAM, the receptor knockout mouse. Finally, we realized that by making chimeric viruses, so one thing, fascinating thing about MHV is that there are many strains of MHV, as you know, and they infect different organs. So you have like a, um, a CNS tropic one, a liver one, uh, the MHV one causes a SARS-like disease, and then there are the animal, um, the animal colony enteric viruses. And so all of these viruses use the same receptor. So we started doing things like interchanging different genes. And what we found was that the spike protein um, was, not the, was not the only determinant of tropism, so that we started thinking about intracellular um, things like, like the innate immune response. And then from there, we got much, very much into innate immune responses to coronaviruses. And then, um, so then my lab took a, a really interesting turn when we found out that um, one protein of, of MHV, the NS2 protein, was a, a very specific it was an enzyme that cleaved 2 prime 2 5 a which is a, the inducer or the activator of ribonuclease L, an antiviral pathway. And once we, we sort of figured that out, we started working with, with Bob Silverman, who is the, the kind of guru of that pathway. And, um, and we got way off into that pathway. And, and we studied it. We studied how, with Bob, how it's, how it's activated, how it's inhibited. We studied very many different viruses. We showed that really only OAS3 and not OAS1 or 2 were, were necessary for activation. Um, we showed that activation, that one really important thing that I think is that this pathway was, is a parallel pathway to interferon signaling. You don't need to activate interferons to um, activate RNA cells so that a virus can shut down interferon signaling but still be uh, susceptible to RNA cell and that some coronaviruses um, encode proteins specifically to, to antagonize that pathway. So we got way off into that. And um, we started studying also um, uh, endogenous double-stranded RNA, which also activates RNA cell, le resulting in cell death. And we got, we got into that and studying um, adenosine deaminase acting on RNA, ADAR. So in the absence of ADAR, you get double-stranded RNA accumulating in cells and it activates pathways, it leads to cell death. And it's also a gene that's, uh, when mutated, can cause um, a, a Cardi Gutierrez syndrome. So we started working with a pediatrician who works on that. So we, so by the time that SARS broke, then SARS-2, um, oh, actually we also were working on MERS because MERS also encodes this phosphodiesterase. So we were kind of more led by the innate immune pathways at that point than we were really by coronaviruses. And then uh, when coronavirus, when SARS-2 uh, came out, we immediately um, got the virus and decided to work on it. And that's what we, we've been, so right, so now, the lab is working on, um, on MHV still, which I think is a really interesting system, on MERS, on SARS. And we've also been, we, we've, we've dabbled with this in the past, but we're also working on um, OC43 and NL63 and 2290, all the, um, the non-lethal coron human coronaviruses. So um, we've really gone back to the coronavirus roots. So it's kind of a big, in a way, kind of circular. Because back in 1980, I wanted to work on 2290 and OC43, but um, at that time, it was really difficult to grow those viruses. Um, so we went to the mouse virus. So yeah, so that's where we are now. Can you describe in more detail your current research on SARS-2 coronavirus? Okay, so right now, um, what we've been doing is sort of following up on the type of stuff we did with MHV and MERS, and that is trying to understand how it interacts with um, these three pathways that, that, that are all activated by double-stranded RNA. So double-stranded RNA is, um, is sensed by, uh, for corona coronaviruses, it's only MDA5 and not Rig I, uh, and that induces interfer type 1, type 3 interferons and, and all the signaling pathways. And then it's also recognized by OAS, oligodenylate synthetase, to activate RNA cell. And then the third major pathway is PKR sensing, leading to, to PKR 
uh, phosphorylation and EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, and both PKR and RNA cell uh, lead to apoptosis um, and, and cell death, and uh, RNA cell also leads to inflammasome activation. So these three pathways are really important um, antiviral defenses. So we've been studying how coronaviruses either activate and or antagonize these pathways. And so what we found with both uh, MHV and MERS is they really, really barely activate. They don't activate RNA cell unless we mutate um, antagonist genes. They don't activate PKR and they activate interferons very, very poorly. And so if you look like MERS, both MERS and MHV, that those are the lineage A and lineage C beta coronaviruses have these phosphodiesterases and the MERS type viruses also have a double strand RNA binding protein. So all of the, these, um, these antagonize all the pathways. In addition to endo-U, which is another protein that all coronaviruses encode, which also downregulates these pathways. Um, so we want, so all in that context, we wanted to see what SARS does. And we were actually kind of surprised because um, we've looked in, uh, we, well, first we had to make cell, we made A549 cells expressing ACE2 so that we could actually, um, th those cells are really easy to work with and, and they now were very infectable by SARS. And also um, we could make knockouts, CRISPR knockouts of those cells, which we like to do to knock out parts of these pathways. And so that took a while to make this. We have really nice cells now. The virus grows really well, causes syncytia, and it activates RNA cell, which was a surprise. So whereas MHV and MERS really antagonize that pathway, uh, SARS-2 activates it. Um, and it sort of makes sense. It doesn't have a PDE, phosphodiester. It doesn't have the specific inhibitor. But it also activates um, phosphorylates PKR. And it also is, um, we, we compared it to MERS and to a MERS mutant lacking antagonists. And it actually behaves more like the mutant uh, so that it's, it's actually less able to shut down these pathways completely than the other viruses. So that's sort of where we are now. Um, and we've also started looking at it um, in, in primary uh, respiratory derived cells, which um, with some colleagues at Penn, which has been really kind of neat also. So that's, that's basically what we've been doing. More personally, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you as an individual, as a woman, and as a researcher? Well, um, it's sort of, I just come back from a sabbatical. Um, so I was, and I was wanting to go on another sabbatical to California. Well, that's not going to happen. Um, so I stayed home because I'm older. I stayed home from March through June, just working like, crazy. I worked so hard um, doing all kinds, you know, running my lab with people. My people were working the whole time because they're essential workers and they're working on, on the virus. We were only one of two labs that's approved at Penn to work on SART. Um, we were already in there working on MERS. So, we, so they continued to work there and I continued to work at home. At the same time, I, I was in a particularly interesting position because, you know, all my background, my long history, I was, I've given 20 seminars since March. Um, so I've been incredibly like just busy doing stuff like that. I've been on all kinds of panels and podcasts. So, so my life has just been like crazy. And then meanwhile, my husband who's retired is like bored and has nothing to do. And I wish I could get him to do some of my work. So, so it's been kind of exciting in a way, but also exhausting. And um, it's also like, for me, it's really incredibly, it's like living in a, um, in, in a twilight zone to, you know, to have my work, um, you know, seem to be of interest to people, which, it, you know, coronaviruses have never really attracted a ton of attention, except for like briefly during SARS and MERS. So it's really different. Um, the rest of my family, my mother's 95. She, um, so we were worried about her. So we, we kind of coerced her to go live, stay with my brother for a few months. So, so that was that. And my, my kids, my, one of my son's is a resident, so he's working with patients, so that's a little bit scary. Uh, my other son is um, a magician, and so he's gone to become a virtual magician. He's working online a lot. Um, so I guess for me, I feel like um, it, you know, I really wish I could go back to traveling and doing things, but I've been so busy, so busy, busier than ever, maybe. Going back to thinking about your scientific career, what was the most exciting eureka moment in your career so far? For me, I think it was, well, a couple, well, 
at the beginning, it was just, there were many times I was really excited because we knew nothing about coronaviruses. So when we started seeing anything, it was exciting, but probably the most like eureka moment was so that, so this, this NS2 protein of, of MHV, we knew for years, it was a small protein. Um, it, it was predicted to be an enzyme, a cyclophosphodiesterase. It, we knew that if you knocked it out, the virus, rep, there was no effect on replication in tissue culture. There was no effect if you injected it into a mouse, there was no effect in, in the brain. Um, and so people were really couldn't figure out what it did. And then finally, we did the experiment of um, injecting it into the, putting it into the liver. And we found that if you um, mutated the catalytic catal residue in this enzyme, that it, it the virus completely lost its ability to replicate in the liver. So that was really, I mean, there's like seven logs of virus to, to two logs of virus. It was like, so this enzyme had an incredible effect on liver tropism, but not in the brain. So that was, that was pretty amazing. And then the real eureka moment was when we started um, trying to, we put the, we try to replicate the mutant and wild type in all kinds of in macrophages from all kinds of knockout mice. And, when we used RNA cell knockout mice, the mutant virus completely recovered. And we should have realized that because we knew that it was a phosphodiesterase, but we didn't really put it together. When, when, when we saw that data, I sent the data to, to Bob Silverman, who um, I didn't really know at the time, but he's the RNA cell guy. He made the mice, which we got from an intermediate person. And he like called me up immediately. And we were like, I mean, it's amazing because this virus, like I said, it was like no replication to completely wild type um, just by knocking out. So it was clear that, that this, um, this protein was an RNA cell antagonist. And that's really all that we couldn't, we don't think it has any other function in the virus particle. And so, and so why does a virus, I mean, why does a virus have that? And, and it's also the same, and then we worked on it a lot and we found the same, the same uh, basically the same uh, protein or enzyme was encoded in just lineage um, A and lineage C beta coronaviruses, but also in rotaviruses and toroviruses. Um, and so that was pretty exciting to, to really figure out a new, it's really a new mechanism that viruses use to antagonize innate immunity and had a profound, profound effect in MHV. And I'm, I'm glad we discovered it first in MHV because its effect in MERS is much more subtle. It's there, but it's much more subtle. Conversely, what is the most difficult thing you've had to overcome as a scientist? And how did you overcome it? Well, one difficult thing is that nobody caring about your work is pretty difficult. <laughs> I, I always, I felt like people around me sometimes, um, like, didn't really appreciate that I was working on this, you know, that dumb mouse virus, that stupid mouse virus, why do you care about it? That kind of thing. And I guess, for me... I mean, I always, I've been funded on MHV since 1981 or something. So that was one way of, you know, thinking, well, it couldn't be that bad because I, you know, NIH is funding me on it. Um, but, you know, it was pretty depressing to think that people thought it didn't matter. But the thing that was so fascinating about this mass virus is that just to be able to study a, a pathogen in its natural host, like we're just talking about SARS, but this virus in its natural host where you can both mutate the virus and mutate the host um, is, is a really elegant system. And, and it, so I continue to think it's really fascinating system to work on. But I, I think that other people didn't find it that um, interesting or rewarding, I guess. Um, and also the woman, the woman thing, I can talk about that a little bit. I think as a woman, when I came to my department, I was um, the second woman ever in the department. And the first woman was still there. She was like my mother's age. So like nobody had been hired in micro department at Penn women in, I don't know, probably 25 years or something. And so, um, and I, and I know I was, uh, I was hired because I was a woman because um, uh, Jim Allwine was hired in the same search and um, they had a lot of women. I was told this afterwards, there were some really women, good women candidates. So they decided to hire one and I, and I was she. So I got hired like almost like affirmative action kind of for women. Um, and then, but once I got hired, I didn't really feel very different, but I do think as a woman and, and probably just my personality too, that I didn't, I wasn't assertive enough. And there were times when I should have um, been asking for more than I actually got. Do you think that has changed over time? Do you feel that women are more supported when they begin their faculty positions today? 
I think I was pretty well supported, like, but my chairman for sure was really supportive of me. Um, so, but there were more, it was a more subtle kind of thing that was different, like maybe not getting paid as much as the men or um, just not giving the same responsibilities, I think, um, th those kinds of things. Now I think that's less so. I see that younger women have more support. There's more support for, like when I did it, there was no, you didn't get an extra year for having a kid or anything like that. And now there are things like that. Um, I think women are maybe expect more now than maybe I, you know, maybe women in my generation were less, um, felt less entitled, but it's all subtle. It's not, not, um, I don't know. It's not, it's not like the woman above me, the, the one who was my mother's age, her generation was really, there were very few women that had tenure track jobs. Then a lot of women had jobs uh, like research associates in their husband's labs. So my generation, I, I was, I was really equal to the others. It just was, like I said, there were sort of subtle differences and also just differences in different, my insecurities, I think. If you had a chance to tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? I think it would be to be more assertive and like not be afraid to ask for what I needed. And I think the other thing that I did was um, probably just, I wasn't, um, assertive enough with my early trainees like i didn't really push them hard enough i sort of my first graduate student who's now a friend really she's only like you know six or seven years younger than me um i you know she took a long time to finish and i, I didn't push her hard enough in retrospect and she's done really well in the end but um so i probably should have and even now i don't i don't i'm not a pusher i don't push my people a lot i kind of give them a lot of space which i in retrospect, I think it was okay, but, but maybe it was too much. Maybe I should have been a little bit more demanding of them, and you know, how they do things. I sort of let them figure things out themselves. Turning back to the COVID-19 pandemic, how do you make decisions about how to keep yourself, your family, your coworkers, and your community safe? My lab is working, like I said, but we're really careful. Everyone's obviously in masks staying apart and trying not to have too many people around at one time, although it's difficult with people working in the lab. Some are up in the BSL-3 and there's my office. Now that, now that I'm back, they used to be using my office. Now I'm there more. So it's a little bit more difficult, but so, so we're trying, we're, we are safe. I believe we're really safe. Um, when I go to work, I drive my car. Then I walk to the office. I walk up the stairs. I'm afraid to go in the elevator because I don't want to be near people too much. So I walk up the elevator, I wash my hands off and all that kind of stuff. Um, I go out every morning and either ride my bike or go for a long walk. Um, and I, and I think it's safe because there's hardly anybody out there and I take a mask, but I only put it on if I, I'm really not around people. So I think I try to go out for me. I need that for my mental health and my physical health. So I think it's important to go outside and not be completely inside all the time and, uh, you know, completely sequestered. So that's what I do. Um, I, I've seen my son and his wife a couple times, but we like eat across a long table or outside. Um, yeah, I haven't seen too many friends. We did have some dinners out in someone's backyard. We haven't gone, at, gone out to dinner at all. We've done some takeouts, um, things like that. As we wrap up our podcast for today, any messages for our listeners? Any thoughts about the future of the COVID-19 pandemic? This is more of a scientific thing that I just, I hope that um, it's really gratifying to see all the people from every different discipline that have kind of come in to work on SARS. Um, I just ask them to please read the old literature because there is stuff in there that like from Kay Holmes, for example, um, you know, like she's discovered the furin site in probably 1980 or something like that, just to read the old literature, because there's a lot of stuff in there that's probably relevant to, to what we're doing today. And I don't know. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm fairly optimistic there'll be a vaccine before too long. And that uh, I think things will get better. Um, I think it's important to keep looking for antivirals because um, they're going to be more effective against against new viruses, new, they're going to be, and there will be new coronaviruses emerging and they may or may not uh, have cross-reactive RBDs with SARS-2. So I think it's important to continue to, to look for pan coronavirus inhibitors. And there are so many um, 
possible enzymatic um, targets for antivirals for this virus. There, there are 16 non-structural proteins, and, and most of them uh, have target uh, enzymes. And, and so I think those enzymes, um, their sequences may not be perfectly conserved, but their kind of binding pockets and structures, I think, are pretty conserved for the most part. All right. Thank you, Susan, for talking with us today about yourself and your research. Yeah, nice talking to you. Susan and the members of her lab work to understand the basic biology of coronaviruses, in particular, how coronaviruses activate or inhibit innate immune pathways, such as OAS, MDA5, or PKR, and believe that this knowledge may lead to new therapies for SARS-2 coronavirus and other emerging coronaviruses. This has been Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about people who study viruses. This is your host, Larissa Thackray, and thanks for listening. You can find us at lmtv.podbean.com to leave a comment about this podcast or to tune in to another podcast. If you are a virologist interested in sharing who you are and what you do, please contact us at letusmeetthevirologists at gmail.com.